<laughs> coming up, John and Kevin take us through their 17-month adventure <laughs> through the South Pacific. All coming up next from the Bob Varley Studio in Orlando, Florida. This is the Diz Unplugged. This is the Diz Unplugged, episode 709 for the week of May 27th, 2014. The Diz Unplugged is brought to you by Dreams Unlimited Travel, experts at helping you plan the perfect Disney vacation. Visit them on the web at www.dreamsunlimitedtravel.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. Coming to you live from the Bob Varley Studio in Orlando, Florida, I'm your host, Pete Werner, joined at the table this week by my good friends, John Magi, Kevin Close, Kathy Whirling, Jenny Lynn Knopp, and back in production nook, our producer, Dustin West, with associate producers, Sean Thompson and Craig Williams. Well, uh, as those of you who watch the show on a regular basis know, John and Kevin have not been here for years. <laughs> and uh, It seems like a very long time. They've been in the uh, South Pacific looking for that Malaysian Airlines flight. <laughs> um, and uh, they have returned to tell us all about their adventures. This is one of those trips of a lifetime. And even though this has absolutely nothing to do with Disney, um, a lot of people have, have asked us about this and... Um, I, uh, you know, it has a little bit to do with Disney because you stayed at Alani at the end of the trip. But this is a Royal Caribbean cruise. Royal Caribbean cruise. Um, Again, trip of a lifetime. This was booked last Christmas, Christmas 2012. I was just going to say, you know, we talked about it before the show. We we said we weren't going to go into too many details because we know we, you know, could be a very long conversation. So I'd like to start with the booking process. (laughs) (laughs) I was born in 1959. (laughs) Start with my story. Actually, a year and a half ago, on a trip we took with our friend Matt. At Christmas. At Christmas, we were up at the rebooking desk, and kind of just for fun, we found this cruise. And it was surprisingly reasonable for the amount of time that it was, and the staterooms that we like were available, and so we put a hold on it, kind of never really thinking we were going to take it. It was kind of, oh, let's have this I never believed this would happen. It was one of those things that's like, oh, yeah, that's great. Let's go ahead. And sure enough, 18 months later... Here we are. We got ready for our trip, and we uh, headed out. We stayed overnight in uh, Honolulu because we couldn't do a flight where it was directly to Australia. The the cruise left out of Australia, Sydney. If anybody's interested in flying Honolulu to Sydney, we were told about a great airline. It's called Jetstar, all one word. And they're kind of like the CarMax of airlines. There's one price. You pay for this for a coach seat or this for a a first class seat. There is no... Uh, variable. Everybody on the plane pays this price, so I thought it was great. Uh, it was like four seventy five for a coach seat or nine seventy five for a first class seat. Like from Honolulu to Australia. Really? <laughs> Do you think that's a lot or a little? I think it's incredibly cheap. Yeah, that's what we thought. That's what the, and really great seats. Um, the, the first class was they gave you an iPad loaded with movies and games. That was your in-flight entertainment. entertainment. Everybody got a lockdown iPad. Now, were these like domestic first class seats or were they the, like, the live flat? No, they were not live flat seats. But they were bigger than domestic first class. And how room. many hours from Honolulu to Sydney? About 10. 100. <laughs> I'm sure it felt like At one point, John says to me, I've watched a movie, I've had a meal, I've taken a nap, I've gone to the bathroom, I've read, I've watched another movie, and I still have seven hours to go. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, let me tell you the plane story. Uh, get on the plane. Again, it was very nice, first-class seats. Now, Kevin and I are sitting together, and it was a little snug. It what? had one of those big consoles between us. So that it was not snug butt-wise, it was snug shoulder-to-shoulder. So uh, we noticed that the, the plane wasn't full. The, uh, the business class cabin, the first class cabin, wasn't full. So Kevin said, would it be okay if I moved over to two seats that were empty? So he could have space and I can have space. So I'm um, sitting in a seat by myself, and Yvette and Emile, our friends from the Netherlands, are sitting behind us. And Kevin is on the other side of the plane. The captain comes on and he starts to make announcements about the plane and what it has and the features that it has and what's going to happen. And we take off. And we get to the point where you can unbuckle your seatbelts and you can walk about the plane. Kevin comes over and leans over and says, I want to go see the poor people with the fountains. And so now my mind's racing. Are you talking about like the outback 
like bush country, like there's supposed to be fountains in Australia. What are you talking about? He goes, no, there's poor people with fountains. Still don't know what you're talking about. John doesn't understand that they made an announcement and they said first class would have beverage service, but um, in coach, there would be two fountains. And I don't know what I was thinking. I had been traveling for an entire day. I thought they meant like Trevi Fountain. <laughs> yeah. I thought they meant like the fountain in Italy, in Epcot. And I was joking about the poor people in coach. I always joke about that. When we walk into all-star sports, I say, hello, poor people. I know. You can write me an email. Um, <laughs> so I said, I want to go see the poor people with the fountains. He says, what are you talking about? I said, well, they've got two fountains back there. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, well, I think it's like to entertain people. That there are fountains, like I think the fountains of Bellagio. I thought it would be World of Color. He <laughs> be a different color. So now John says to me, "Do you realize they mean water fountains?" I said, "Wait a minute. The people in Coach don't get water brought to their desk or their seat. They have to go get water from a water fountain." I never made it back to Coach. John and Yvette and Emil talked about this for 18 days. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think even fascinated you more that they had to go get their own water out of the water. I was fountain. fascinated by that they had water fountains on an airplane. So you line up to get a water dr- a drink? Oh, my gosh. We get to Australia. We meet up with our friend Matt, who has arranged a beautiful hotel for us. If you've ever seen the Sydney Opera House, if you went down that little arm of that area that we were four buildings from the Sydney Opera House. Oh, wow. Which is right the same area that Walter and I stayed when we were in Sydney. We stayed in a hotel, and that's part hotel and part residence. Nicole Kidman lived upstairs. Oh. I was not allowed through that door. (laughs) (laughs) He wanted to wait in the lobby for Nikki. Nikki. (laughs) Nikki Kidman. Um, We were right across from the Harbor Bridge. Mm -hmm. That's where the ship pulled in. We had one day in Australia. We had, like, less than 24 hours. We got there at 4 o'clock, and the ship departed the next day. But our friend Matt did something really great. He said to to us, what do you want to do in Australia? And we kind of gave him the highlights. We want to see a koala. We want to see a kangaroo. We want to see Sydney Opera House. We want to do this and this. He goes, I've got it covered. uh, We got on a ferry right by where our hotel was. We took a little ferry tour. We saw Luna Park. Mm-hmm. The went opera, under the bridge. Went under the bridge, saw the opera house, and wound up at what is kind of like a tourist zoo. It's the Sydney a, Zoo. The Sydney, well, no. No, the Sydney Zoo is further out. This is now called the Sydney Experience, and it's relatively new. Oh, okay. And it's, it's an enclosed kind of, zoo. It's all inside, so it's air-conditioned. And it's kind of like Australia combined into a two-hour experience. We got to see koalas. We got to see kangaroos. We got to see um, wallabies. Wallabies, crocodiles, and uh, hundreds of snakes that can kill you. Because everything in Australia can kill you. Exactly. Did you see Crocodile Dundee? No, we did not. You didn't even watch it on your way over? Oh, no, I know. I feel like I've seen the movie. Um, I would not recommend this instead of seeing Well of Sydney, but we had a morning. Right. So this was great. It was we got to see everything that was on the list. The only thing that we missed was a platypus. They didn't have one of those in the zoo. We got to see a wombat. I was very excited. So our very small slice of Australia and Sydney was incredible. We had, oh, that's nice. It was an, an unbelievable day. It was like, I don't know how to describe it. I had the best scrambled eggs I've ever had in my life. We had good food. We were in a great location. I watched the ship pull into port the next morning. So our stunning. hotel, If you when you looked out our window, and we, uh, if you picture a rectangular, one whole corner of our rectangular room was glass. And the dock for the ship was right next to the, uh, the harbor bridge. So when you looked out the window, you could see where the boat would dock. So the next morning when we got up, our ship was there. And that's a wow. great, that, that docking area, because we're looking at this oh, picture now, um, that docking area is uh, some great restaurants and shops in mm-hmm. there. When it's not used for the <laughs> ships to come in, it's very high-end. It is. It's restaurants. It's incredible. And, you know, I, I, I did Sydney, I think it was back 2009. I went, uh, we went to Australia. And I'm so glad that we spent, because we were on the ABD trip, and we spent two or three days with ABD in Sydney, and then Walter and I added on seven days to stay uh, in Sydney, and I'm so glad we did. And being a New York guy, um, New York will always be the greatest city in the world to me, but Sydney is the most beautiful. Um, I fell in love with that city. It, it just, 
the food, the culture, the atmosphere, everything about it. I'm sorry that we didn't have longer because yeah. it was a long way to travel. However, when you're on an 18-day cruise and you've got time at the end in Australia, eventually something has to give. So the next day after we uh, went and did all that cool stuff was the day we got on the ship. Um, it was the Radiance of the Seas, which is not the newest, b- biggest Royal Caribbean ship out there. So I was a little worried. I thought, oh my gosh, we're going to be 18 nights on a garbage small ship. Right. It's about the same size as the Magic. Right. However, it's one of the ships in Royal Caribbean's fleet that has gotten what they call the Oasis makeover. So a lot of the restaurants that are on the Oasis, um, Park Cafe, uh, Samba Grill, uh, Rita's Cantina, are all on this ship now. Some successful and some not so. Right. The uh, the decor is beautiful. They did a great job of rehabbing the ship. The ship looked great. Our room was spectacular. I couldn't say enough nicer things about our room. Um, we had a great time. It was a great ship to be on for this sailing. I was really Even worried for that about many it. days. For that many days. We had two days at sea right out of the bat. And we went to Picton and Wellington, New Zealand. Picton reminded me of Cape Cod with palm trees. However, it was 40 degrees. Mm. We're, um, they're going in, they were going into their winter season, so it was very chilly. Mm. We met, um, oh my gosh, I've lost her name, Paula oh. Sillers and her mom and right. her husband. They, came, they drove four hours to see us. Oh, bless them. And hearts. I kept saying to them, I wouldn't have driven four hours to come see you. You guys are crazy. <laughs> but we spent the day with them, and we loved it. It was the highlight <laughs> of our day there. The next day was Wellington. Wellington, um, both ports we pulled into, there were hundreds and hundreds of thousands of trees cut down. Logging is a big deal on that side of New Zealand. I don't know why there it is. Royal Caribbean picked these particular ports. They are not pretty ports. There was nothing to do at the port. You had to take that a was bus from our state and go home. somewhere. And while Picton was a cute little town... Um, it would be like dropping you off in Jacksonville. Right. And Wellington was more metropolitan. That's what I mean about Wellington. Yeah, it was more metropolitan, but it was like, you know, it wasn't anything high, high end. So it was a very strange... Prices were very, very high in New Zealand. Really? Some, a bottle of lotion. I keep talking about this because it's, I was looking in a pharmacy window, and a bottle of lotion that we would pay 5 or $6 here was $49. $49? So prices in New Zealand were well, high. Well, generally speaking, prices in Australia are, yeah, are higher. Expensive. Um, you've got that. I don't know what it is now, but if, uh, when we were there, if I recall correctly, it was a 20% VAT tax. Uh, VAT is value-added tax um, on pretty much everything. You're paying an additional 20%. Um, but, you know, the other side of that is they pay everyone a living wage. Remember being in Sydney and having a discussion with a guy working at a coffee house. Um, they were making like regular American brewed coffee, and you don't find that in Australia. It's done differently. It's the European style of making coffee. Everything's made in the way we would make espresso, except they're using not espresso beans. Uh, we were told the lady who waited on us that the morning we left our ship departed. We went to breakfast, and we were told she was making twenty one fifty an hour to well, wait this, on us. Uh, in, in talking with this guy, um, he had mentioned that he had just. Uh, just gotten an apartment in Sydney. Um, and I said, well, do you live with roommates? He's like, no, no, I live by myself. I said, do you own the shop? He's like, no, no, I just work here. I said, okay, I'm sorry, I have to ask. How much do you make? And I believe he said it was either forty five dollars or $50,000 a year. Minimum as wage, a, I think, was $21. As a, as a, as a, as a, you know, as a barista. Um, that's and that's why they... Pay that now. What they do, though, when you're in Australia and you're buying things, if you buy things over a certain amount of money, I believe it's anything over a hundred dollars. When you go to the airport to fly home, you can provide the receipts, and they will refund mm-hmm. that value-added tax back to you. Very much so, like Europe. That's Europe, also. You know. I also want to mention that besides um, a vet and a meal, the Nether people, Jeff and Val were on our, tr- our trip. He's old Key West lover on the boards, and we met uh, an Australian family who was on the trip, who is also who are also listeners, Leanne Ryland and her husband Leon and their their son Alex. So we had quite a traveling party. We made great friends. We did. They actually have a present for you, Pete. They sent a present. Oh. It's in my pocket. Reaching into his <laughs> pants, I'm like, oh, what's going to happen? <laughs> That's for Pete. Sliced beetroot. See, so for now your burgers. You, see, now you can make burgers at home because you have Bless sliced beetroot. 
Bless their heart. They were very, very sweet. Leon didn't wasn't sure we were actually going to do this. There you go, Leon. Yep. I, I have beetroot. So I'm going to jump ahead. After we left um, New Zealand, we had four sea days. And they were wonderful. They were kind of uneventful. I think we had one night that was a little rough. Mm -hmm. uh, we then got to French Polynesia. And I'm going to be honest with you. I love cruising. I'm not a big fan of the Caribbean islands, and I've said this before. There's not a lot for me to do on that. If I take John out to the beach, he's going to start to sizzle. Um, we don't drink. We don't scuba snooba snorkel. I do not want to go on a pirate cruise. I have enough tablecloths and enough liquor. I find myself wanting something to do on a Caribbean island. So I went into this thinking, these are going to be like the Caribbean. I'm wrong. I'm flat out wrong. Furthest from the truth. We stopped at Morea which was apparently the black pearl capital of the world. It is the lushest. It looks like Jurassic Park. It looks like Gilligan's Island. This was the most beautiful. There it is. There's the black sand beaches. We visited black sand beach. It was just lovely. And in um, Morea, we hired a minivan and a lovely female driver. I'm sorry, I've forgotten her name right now, but she had the little flower lay around her head. Mm. And she took us around and showed us every inch of Morea. So something I want to just really quick mention is a lot of people say, I'm going to someplace different. What shore excursion should I do? What, what should I do so I can make sure I enjoy the island? Something we do pretty much every time we go someplace new is I look for a cab driver. I say how many of us there are and what we want to do. We want to do a tour of the island. We want to see the tourist places, but we also want to see places that you are proud of. We negotiate a price, and we have the best time. Every single time we got off in port, we did this. And this young lady was incredible. So proud of her home. So proud of her island. I couldn't say nicer things about it. We stopped at one place where there was a bus from the ship with people with the little stickers on who were doing the... And the lady came over and she said to me, you're from our ship. I said, right. She said, can you tell me what you're paying for this private car? I said, it's $40 a person for three and a half hours. And she said, we paid $125 and we make one stop. Wow. So you run the risk. Now, if something happened to our car, the ship will not wait for us like a Correct. sanctioned... However, we were we felt pretty comfortable. We did it early enough in the day, and we didn't do it all day. It was a couple hours, but she was incredible. Showed us all the highlights of the island. This is um, the island that has Bally High on it. Mm -hmm. So Kevin, of course, had to sing. <laughs> we got to Bally I think the people High. on Twitter were singing too, but I'm not sure. We did get to see Bally High. Uh, we got back on the ship, and the next day we went to. Do you guys have the two pictures of the the one is of a bay. There's Bally High behind me. All these pictures for those listening will be, uh, we'll have a link to them on the show notes page this week, disunplug.com, so you can check out uh, the pictures from their trip. So, and just incredible stuff we saw. Um, we stopped at the hotel that's famous for having the huts over the island. This is over the, the Hilton, water. I'm sorry, the Hilton with the, the Hilton on Morea. And we asked what they were at the front desk and the man said those rooms are very expensive and we said well how much are they he said during high season they're eight hundred dollars a night <laughs> and i think that was bad and that's the floor, fantastic floor, the floor is glass yeah so you can see below so again part of what we do is this thing is we want to see all the highlights but we're not lingerers we tell her this we say we're not going to go someplace and spend 20 minutes but we go we get out we move on to the next place so we got to cover the entire island which was incredible and it's great. It's just wonderful. You move at your own pace. We highly recommend this. So the next day, we got back on the ship, and we went to Bora Bora. And Bora Bora was a little more... Touristy. Touristy than Morea. Morea looked like we were walking into paradise. Bora Bora had more of a... There were more shops. There were more restaurants. Uh, but... We still had a good time. We did the exact same thing. They took us out to a beach. Um, the gentleman who was driving us around Morea was very excited about his island, and he would show you where the locals would go. This is We went to a, a beach on the other side of the island, and he said these people would all live here. This is what they do on their, you know, their day off. So Bora Bora was very much like Morea. Our third stop was Papiete Tahiti. 
And after seeing two glorious islands, we were a little disappointed in Tahiti. Really? Tahiti Papiete is the city in French Polynesia that is the access point to all of these other places if you're coming in by plane. So it's much more city-like than tropical island. Okay. And I think the thing that disappointed us the most is we landed there on Easter Sunday. So virtually everything in the port was closed. Oh. It was, even taxis were not abundant. So we didn't do an island tour on this. We walked along the waterfront, and if you can picture any city where you live, where virtually everything is closed, it had an unsavory and unsafe feel to it. We felt like we were kind of, we stuck out like a sore thumb. Mm. Um, we didn't spend a lot of time in Papiete. People said that did excursions, that the rest of the island is lovely. However, Papiete is a fair-sized city for one of these islands. But, like, for instance, if you wanted to go to Morea, you would fly into Papiete and then take... They said usually the um, hotel you're staying at will come and pick you up by boat. Oh. And it's usually a half hour from one island to the next. So, would you agree with me? It's not... It wasn't our favorite stop. It was nice enough. But after seeing uh, Morea and Bora Bora, it was kind of a little bit of a disappointment. Mm. But uh, everything was closed. Right. And that was just the function of when we got there. Right, exactly. The next day we left again and we had five sea days. And I think this was the part that we all kind of dreaded. We all thought, oh, five more sea days. Holy smokes. However, it was wonderful. We had, there was a bunch of us, so we all got to hang out. We would sit and dinner would take three or four hours because we were all sitting around shooting the breeze. There was one point that completely freaked me out. It was day three in the middle of five days. And every day at noon, the captain would make announcements. And he came on the announcement and he said, blah, blah, blah. We are 2,000 miles from the nearest land, and the nearest land is behind us. We just left. It's Tahiti. Wow. And we are on three and a half miles of water. Wow. And I thought, we are in the geographic center of nowhere, (laughs) and there's three and a half miles of water beneath me. And you kind of lose your cool for a minute, and it's like, holy moly, no one knows where we are. I mean, it, it passed. Something really cool happened on these days. They had a ceremony for everybody on ship who crossed the equator. They had an equator crossing ceremony, and everybody was invited up on deck. And apparently in old sea lore, maritime tradition, maritime lore, if you have crossed the equator, you are a, heart, a shellback. If you have not crossed the equator, you are a slimy polybog, and you must be dealt with. <laughs> so they had a... a event up on deck and they asked for a couple of volunteer polywogs and they tortured them they took around a giant fish and everybody had to kiss it they got last night's spaghetti and they smeared it all over everybody's head oh that's they're, why there's no pictures of you guys doing it then. oh please <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to tell you this, this event was highly attended you could finding a spot to even stand on deck was hard I think everybody well we didn't have anything to do we were in the middle of the ocean so everybody came to it. Oh, there's a picture of it. Um, yeah. See, I thought you guys were going to take part in it. I didn't know that it was going to be that. Oh, it was kind of like honorary. Everybody who attended okay. was part of the okay. ceremony, but these were the folks who volunteered to have this stuff done to them. After this, as it got towards the end of our sea days, everybody on the ship got a beautiful certificate that said you had not only crossed the international date line, but you had crossed the equator. equator, and it told you the time and the coordinates where you crossed. I thought it was really cool, and they did that for everybody on the ship. That is cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. That was kind of a big deal, and I don't know why, but I was really looking forward to that. It was kind of like something to say I've done. John decided there would probably be a gift shop. I thought for sure, (laughs) right at the equator. My late mother has a certificate from when she was going over to Japan, and she crossed. So that was 1940-something. So, I mean, those certificates mean something to people. It's a big deal. Yeah. I guess. I I thought it was a big deal. (laughs) For these these sea days, too, I also want to just mention, too, that you know, we talk about there's a casino and, you know, we hung out with people and had a great time. There's some other things, too. Something that this ship had that not all all Royal Caribbean ships have is they took one of their um, venues and they make it into a theater. They played a lot of movies. They played Saving Mr. Banks. They played Mary Poppins. So some pretty big movies. So you can see me saving Mr. Banks and Mary Poppins back to back. They That's played, cool. They played movies up on deck. We went up on night, uh, one night and watched... Um, All of us did. Everybody that I just told you was on the ship, we watched um, the one with Jack. Some Like It Hot. Some Like It Hot. Oh. So it was on cool. the Jumbotron. There was yeah. never a lack of anything to do. 
it was always and there were other activities. They always, you know, there were belly flop contests, and, and were, this was this was in the this was during the you know twenty or thirty minutes a day you were not in the casino. Pretty much when it was closed, <laughs> <laughs> I had to go do something else. Did the casino ever close? Yes, as a matter of fact, because we were in Maui, we we're in uh, yeah, we we're in Maui uh, all day. We landed at, we docked at like 7 a.m. and we didn't leave until 1 a.m. We never went back into international waters. Waters that stopped two days before, the, it closed two days before the cruise ended. Right. So you had to sort of do your last game. But I mean like uh, on those sea days, was it open? Told, they would, it would, they would post that it was open until 2 or 3, but I was told that if they had people gambling, we did not find a lot of gamblers on this cruise. It was pretty much Kevin and I and one sad old lady in <laughs> the casino every day. No. I played three card poker with a woman who I don't think she had any clue as to what she was doing. <laughs> Not a clue. Um, we had some interesting groups of people on the ship. Um, first of all, there was a great many Australians, and it shocked me when she would start talking to them. This started in the ship started in Seattle, and came down and went along the north coast of Australia, all the way around. Australia into Tasmania, stopped at Sydney, was going on to Hawaii, and then back to Seattle for the um, oh. for the Alaska, Alaska cruises cruise. for the start of the summer. We talked to people who had been on the ship for forty five days. Wow! And were staying on until until they got, they to, got Seattle. to Seattle. Wow! There was people who were on the ship that the longest I talked to, I believe, was forty five. So I was shocked to hear that because I thought eighteen days was a long time. Yeah. And I enjoyed myself start to finish. I didn't want to stay for forty five days. Right? No, I couldn't do that. So there was a great many Australians. There was a great many German people. There was a group of about 900 German people. There were so many German people that all of the announcements were done twice, once in English, once in German. Okay. And for some reason, the German stuff went on really long. They would say, today the, um, the buffet will be open from 11 to 1, and then they would make the announcement in German. And 12 minutes later, you'd think, what are they saying? <laughs> They're telling them everything on the buffet. Right. <laughs> There was also about 800 people who were deaf on the ship. They booked through a travel agency that specializes in deaf travel. Oh, really? Yeah. And it was very interesting. I spoke to one of the interpreters. This was so successful among the deaf community that in 2015 they have chartered a ship. Wow. Wow. Well, that's so, cool. Um, it, it was fascinating to watch. We were just talking about this before. If you were, If they were in a public space... They were kind of quiet and low key. If they were by themselves in a room, they vocalized. So it was fascinating to see the difference. There was a lot of activities just for them, where they would have special, kind of like doing a podcast cruise. They arranged stuff just for them. It was great. It was a, every was, announcement on TV was um, signed. They even had they had dance lessons every day. And every day they would do a different dance class. And one of them coincided with a bingo, and we went to it. So we got there towards the end of the dance class, and they had a dance class. They invited uh, folks who were deaf to join in the dance class, and they had somebody who clapped the rhythm. To It was fascinating wow, to me. Wow, that's very cool. I, I know a very minuscule amount of sign language. And we were on a tender one day, and I was watching two ladies sign, and I told them that my name was Kevin. I can sign that. And they signed back. One lady told me her name was June, and the other lady started to sign it and then picked up her ID and just pointed to her name. Her name was Eleanor. <laughs> and I thought, you're right, I never would have gotten that. But whenever I ran into them on other parts in the ship, they would sign to everyone they were with that my name was Kevin and that I was a friend. Cool. It was charming. It was really lovely. The next stop uh, after our big, long sea days was Maui. Now, before we get to Maui, a couple of things about the ship. We got a lot of questions about how it was uh, the ship in general. I mentioned it was very, very nice, rehabbed. Everything was great. Uh, we found the meals actually to be really good. We never ate dinner in the dining room, but we did a lot of breakfast and lunch in the dining room. And surprisingly, the food was very good. Yeah, wow. It really Not was. just good. It was like, let's go back to the dining room and eat. That's Something they had in the dining room every single day was they had what they called um, Brasserie 30. And they would kind of cordon off one little section of the dining room, and they had a brasserie menu. And something else they had every day was a fresh salad bar. So you could walk along and build your own salad. Now, they mm. built it for you, but it was really good. Good food. So uh, we found the food to be very good. And uh, one, the only place where things sort of weren't great on the ship was service. 
The service was very, very hit or miss. And it was, we had a stateroom attendant who was incredible. We loved her. Maybe one of the best I've ever had. Just blew us away. And there were other things where it was like, you wondered like if they knew what they were doing. Mm. Like we would say, we would show up someplace and for lunch, and it was like they were surprised. We'd go to the specialty restaurants, and it was like they were surprised people showed up. And they'd have to set a table and stuff. It was all very weird. And one of the things that we understand, this was what we were told by several people, was that the uh, regular staff actually planned their break during these cruises because they knew that there'd be a lot of Australian people on the cruise and Australian people don't tip. Oh. It's not part of their culture to tip. We talked about because they make a, a living wage, they don't tip in restaurants and things like that. So they don't un- really get that concept. So they were the regular staff would kind of said, listen, we're not going to get tipped, so let's coincide our break for that. So we kind of had, you know, people, a lot of people who were training. Um, uh, Jeff and Val's um, stateroom attendant met them the first day and said, well, i got to go. This is my first day. I have to go to training. Oh, jeez. I was like, okay, there you go. I did something I've never done on a cruise ship before. I actually filled out a complaint form. Did you? Mm-hmm. What happened? I asked a bartender. They... You get the soda pass. You pay for it. So I, they had little small glasses, and they had larger glasses. And I said to him, I'm going to take this back to my stateroom. Could I have a larger glass? It just means I don't have to take two small right, glasses. Right. And he turns around, and he looks at me. I'm going to give you a small glass. And I said to him, well, why would you do that? What difference does it make if I take two small glasses or I take one big glass? It just means because sometimes I walk with a cane, and on a cruise ship for balance, I use my cane. So I really only have one hand free. And he turned around, and there was one of the... So he was behind the bar, and he turned around, and there was a server there. And he got making faces at her like I was crazy or stupid. And then said to her, can you believe this guy? He turned around and said, Are you kidding? I said, what's your name? And he said, Olin. I said, Olin, I'm going to go make a formal complaint. There's no reason for... I mean, this was like on day three. I said, there's no reason for this. It's not like I asked you to do anything out of the ordinary. Sometimes you give me a small glass and sometimes you give me a big glass. I'm asking for a big glass of soda. It's a difference between probably 10 ounces, maybe 20 ounces. But it means I don't have to walk back downstairs. And I've paid for the soda. Because you pay by the day. And I forget what ours was for the week. It's like $7 a day. So for after 18 days, I've spent a lot on soda. But yeah, I, I wow. actually formally complained. So that would be the only real complaint. Was we really had some hit or miss with the staff. So our second to last stop is Maui. Uh, in Maui, we actually tendered, and this was probably one of the scariest tenders we had ever oh, been on. Really? The seas were so high and so rough that they had to time it when you stepped on the tender. It wasn't just. Oh, it wasn't unusual. It wasn't like storm rough. It's just these were big waves. And as you went, I still have a scar on my knee from this. When you went out to get on the tender, they would hold you back. And I'm not exaggerating when I tell you, you know how they have the step and then there's a step yeah. into the boat? At times, there was a four or five foot the, difference. The boat would go down five feet. Whoa. Between the, the dock you were, the part of the boat you were standing on and the little tender you had to get on. There was two people in the boat waiting to catch you as you flew into the boat. It was rough. Wow. I don't get seasick. I don't take boning. I don't take anything. On the way back across to the ship, we had to wait for another tender to depart so we could pull in. I actually had to put my head down and not look. This boat was jumping from the horizon line four or five feet. Wow. And in a small boat. It was very unusual Jeez. for us. So Maui was beautiful. Did the same thing. We got a, a driver to drive us around, saw the highlights of the island. Um, did a little shopping. We ate in a really great little restaurant. The Lahaina Seafood Market, it was called. And when you walked through the restaurant, you walked in, and it was kind of uh, nautical and dark, and you walked out, and there was no back to the restaurant. It was all just open to the ocean, and there were pillars holding the roof up, and our ship, from where our table was, our ship was framed perfectly on the pillar. Wow. So it was, the food was really good. Oh, there it is. That's funny you should talk about that. There you go. <laughs> Um, it was great. I don't, uh, Maui to me, and people always talk about when they go to Hawaii, I go to Maui, Maui's great. In my opinion, Oahu is better. 
Oahu has sort of more to do. There's a place where you can go where it's exciting and there's touristy stuff and you go to places where it's very laid back. Maui to me was extremely laid back. John and I are not lay around the pool and spend the whole day doing nothing kind of people. We are more active than that. I know it doesn't sound like it most of the time. <laughs> but we are more active. No, when you're when you're traveling you are very active. Yep. Right. right. So we didn't find we thought there probably wasn't enough to keep us busy in Maui that we like the island of Oahu. But those are the only two we've been to, so I'm not judging all of Hawaii. Then the next morning was our departure morning. We uh we got to um Oahu, we got to uh what's the port called? Aloha Tower. Aloha Tower, which was very cool to sort of step out of your stateroom and that's what you see. Sort of see Aloha Tower. And that was the end of our cruise. And we headed to Alani. We had three nights in Alani. Mm-hmm. And we had done something in Alani that was very cool, knowing that this was the end of our cruise and that, you know, we kind of wanted a soft landing. Was I got the Grand Villa Ooh. that faces the ocean. Wow. Where it's all the rooms face the ocean at Alani. And all the rooms have a private bathroom. <laughs> and we invited Jeff and Val and Matt to stay with us. Yvette and Emil had done uh, Pre. pre-nights in Hawaii. They had to be stay home at a certain time, so they couldn't stay. And Leanne and Leon had other plans, so they couldn't stay with us. So it was just Jeff and Val and Matt and John and I. So we each had our own private bedroom and our own private bathroom, and we had rented a car. The balconies all across the back of the room, and it was... It was so beautiful, you kind of didn't want to leave the room. Yeah. It was like, I don't want to go out. This that is was incredible. the view from our balcony. From our wow. sitting on our balcony, the entire lagoon at Alani. That's breathtaking. Alani is incredible. We talked about this before. I, I don't know what it is that Disney has done, but they've created that thing that I now urge to get back to. How do I get back? How do I scheme to get back there? This is my third time at Alani. The first time we went sort of during the construction phase to report on the very early days. The second time we went back, uh, you were there. Mm-hmm. We went as a, a group. We took a bunch of the agents with me. And I had the worst bout of sciatica I've ever had. If you remember, I walked Ben over for the entire yeah, week. Yeah. I was absolutely miserable. I was comfortable in bed or sitting in the van seat. So that was it. I was, mm. It was awful the rest of the time. This is the first time I've ever felt good and enjoyed Olani. And I can't wait to go back. We actually did the Lazy River, which might have been the most fun Isn't we it had okay. for 19 days. We tried to figure out how we could put a Lazy River in our house. <laughs> I got a funny story to tell you. <laughs> Jeff and Val are traveled with us. They are the perfect couple. They just get along so well, and they're so charming, and they're so much fun to be with. Well, they decided to share a two-person raft. Like the big plastic inner tube. Yeah. We were floating along the Lazy River. And Jeff said, Val, you're going the wrong way. Val, turn us. Val, we're causing a roadblock. Val, we're going too fast. Val, we're going too slow. Well, it lasted about three minutes, and she looks at me, and she goes, help me out of this, Kevin. I said, why was it wrong? She goes, I am tired of being fussed at. (laughs) At which point, she kind of flipped over and disappeared into the lazy river. She flung herself off that raft. And she came up about four or five feet from us, and the the, the laughter was just contagious. Now, no one told Jeff this was going to happen, and we had to go sit against the wall and wait for him to come around. (laughs) So we really did have a good time. I loved traveling with them. I loved traveling with Yvette and Emile. They were great, great traveling companions, and I can't tell you how lovely it was to have them there and to share this That's with That's awesome. We, uh, we had people who had never been, so we kind of did a, really our own island tour. We rented a car. We went to Waikiki. We actually drove all the way around the island. We did the North Shore. and we Loved did doing that. Kailua and everything in a day. It was really We love going to Kailua, where Waikiki is crazy and busy and very New York City meets the beach. Kailua is very laid back, dude. Um, and it's where, where Koalina, I don't know if you all know this, but the island of Oahu has all of the temperate zones on the planet except for Arctic. Hmm. You can find every temperate zone wow. on Earth is on Oahu. So Koalina, where um, Alani is, is kind of the desert. Okay. Kailua on the other side is very rainforest. It's very tropical and very lush. And to get there takes about 25 minutes. And John says it's the prettiest drive he's ever driven in his life. Oh, isn't it gorgeous going around that island? I love that. So, So, again, trip of a lifetime until our next trip of a lifetime. Yeah. (laughs) We have one a year. Now we have two a year. 
Well, that's so. that, that's awesome. Um, I, I you know I'm so excited. I'm, I'm heading out to Hawaii in July and going back to Alani for a little while and doing the Norwegian cruise around Very the Very excited to hear about that ship. We did a tour of that ship, and while it was interesting because they have a very weird theme, it's an Americana theme, I'm really interested to see how it is for that for that. I want to see how it stacks up. Yeah. I'm more interested in what you think of the different islands. Yeah, that I can't wait. That I can't wait. We have, we have some great shore excursions planned. So, But uh, awesome. Well, I'm just really glad you guys are back, and I'm Thank thrilled you. you had such a good time. Um, show's not the same without you, uh, though, so you can never leave again. <laughs> um, but uh, great to have you back. Thanks for sharing your your great trip with us. That's going to do it for this episode. We hope you enjoyed it. We'll be back with you again next time with another edition of the Diz Unplugged. Thanks for being with us, everyone. And remember, stay out of the damn lakes. Have a good week. <laughs>